Uh, if you're a guest with us today, my name's Kevin. I serve as the lead pastor. Just welcome to Greenbelt this morning on kind of another snowy Sunday, three in a row. That's awesome. I love it. The hardcore people show up. It's great. And special welcome to those of you that are joining us online as well. It's great that you can join us that way as well. So um, one of the things I love about social media, one of the things I love about the internet and the day and age that you and I live in today is we actually have the opportunity to learn from people that in any other point in history, we would never have had the opportunity to do so. Like when I think of like the leadership that's available, the training that's available, the resources that are available, it's absolutely mind boggling what we have access to, to learn in our kind of digital age today. Last spring, I think it was April or May, instead of having to get on an airplane and book a hotel and pay for expenses, right from the comfort of my own office, I could sit down and learn from world-renowned experts just through this online conference. And so this was an, a, a panel of experts who had gathered to talk about the issue of morality. I mean, that's a big topic in the world, in the country, in the culture that we find ourselves living in today, is what is the absolute truth about morality? Is there an absolute truth to morality? Is your view of morality just as valid as someone else's view of morality? What is the role of government to legislate and legalize morality? It, it gets really messy really fast. So in this online conference, again, I was just you know, sitting in my office having coffee in one of my Star Wars mugs, and I'm learning from these experts, and they had a panel. So a panel of experts, they had a Christian theologian, they had a Jewish rabbi, they had a Muslim imam, they had a secular humanist, and they had a professor who was an atheist. Now, I know what you're thinking, or oh, you're setting up a joke, Pastor Kevin. <laughs> okay, this is not a joke. This is a real thing. Like, I'm not going to, like, pull the rug out from under you and go, that's psych, it's a joke. This was a real thing, something I really watched online. And the moderator asked this panel of experts this question. Are the Ten Commandments a valid source of morality for the world today? That's a big question. Are the Ten Commandments kind of a, something that we should put on culture today when it comes to the topic of morality? And then he went through the panel and let each one kind of defend their position. I'll summarize their position real simply. The Jewish rabbi said, absolutely. The Muslim imam said, yes, absolutely. The secular humanist said, yes. The atheist professor said, yes. The Christian theologian said, no. And here's what's funny, because I, you know, the first service, people are the responsible, what? In this service, it's like, oh, that's a horrible theologian. So I've spent the last May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, January, nine months sitting in the Ten Commandments, talking, looking at morality, reading about this, and he's not wrong. See, think about it for a moment. If you know anything about the Ten Commandments, the first five have to do completely and totally with God. Why? Would anyone expect people who don't believe in God to build a morality system around the existence and worship of God? It is not a list of commandments for everybody. And as I've wrestled with this, as I've been kind of studying this for months, like I've kind of put it on the calendar to do this series now. And honestly, I've been chomping at the bits for the last six months going, oh, this sermon sucks. I want to do the Ten Commandment one. But I, I trust kind of God in the process and when I put these things together. So I'm trusting that this is the time when God wants to deliver this type of a sermon series because it's how he put it on my heart and built it around this. And I want us to spend the next five weeks talking about the Ten Commandments. Because again, we're living in a very messy time in history. Again, the, the arguments, the debates about morality, what's right, what's not right, all of these things, how does this play out? 
And we as the church, I believe, have a role to play in the conversation about morality. And so we have to look at this, but it's important that we have to look at it in the context that it was written, the context it was given, what did it mean then, what did it mean in the times of Jesus, and what does it mean for the church today in 2020? That's kind of going to be the goal over the next five weeks. So today we're going to start right at the very beginning. If you have a Bible with you, you can open up to Exodus chapter 20. If you're new to the Bible or if you don't own a Bible, there's one in the chair in front of you. You can keep that as our gift to you today if you don't own one. Exodus is the second book in the Bible. It's right near the beginning. Exodus chapter 20 is what we're going to look at. And we're going to start, we're going to look at commandment number one and commandment number two today. Very familiar topic. If you grew up in church, you have gone through the Ten Commandments a billion times in Sunday school. But a lot of the times when we take lessons of Sunday school and we think we know it, we think we understand it, sometimes we miss the depth of what is actually being taught. So in order to kind of set up what we're going to talk about today, I want to just ask you the question, real simple question today. Have you ever idolized someone? Have you ever idolized someone? See, again, we live in a day and an age where we can learn from anybody. We can learn from experts in any industry. If you have a hobby, you can learn from the best of the best on these hobbies. I've I've shared this before. I have a home, which is a fixer-upper house. I am not, not a handy person. But praise be to YouTube, okay, and the almighty Google that I can watch a video and step by step do exactly what the video says to do. Don't deviate from it. Don't switch. If it's that tool, I buy that tool. Danielle goes, why'd you buy that one? That one's three times more expensive. You could buy that one. The video said that one. So I'm not deviating from it. And I can do work that I never dreamed possible. I watch just following step by step so we can learn from so many people. And it's amazing and it's such a privilege. And so we bring in a lot of people into our lives who we admire. You might admire a family member. You might admire a teacher. You might admire a colleague at work. There might be a, a, someone in your church, a, an elder, a small group leader, a fusion leader, someone that you admire because of you know, their faith and, and what they have brought into your life. The challenge that I want us to unpack as we kind of look at the first of the Ten Commandments, the first two of the Ten Commandments, is how easily admiration turns into idolatry. I remember when I was a brand new Christian 20 years ago, this new TV show came on TV called American Idol. And I was attending church, and the Christians started getting ippity. You know what I mean by that? When Christians get ippity, it's Christians just start getting uptight about culture. And Christians start getting uptight about what's on TV. And they were uptight over the fact that there's this show now called American Idol. We're not supposed to have idols. I don't have any idols. So when we talk about idol, I'm pretty sure, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and just make the assumption that none of you have a carven statue in your home that you bow down and worship to. I'm just going to make that assumption, okay? Not a judgment thing, just an assumption. I'm going to assume that none of you have kind of a tree stump in your backyard that you bring offerings to, that you bring money, and you put 10% of your income into, an, into a tree trunk and leave it there for the gods to do with as they please, If you do have such a tree trunk, if you could let our deacons know your address, they would love to come and help deal with that stump, okay? So I'm going to make these assumptions. See, so when we talk about idolatry as Christians, we think like that and we make these, you know, we basically go, I don't have idols. I don't have anything like that. But the human heart is a fascinating thing to study. And the reality is, if we actually peeled open our hearts a little bit, and if we were real with one another, if we were real before God, I'm willing again to bet that every single one of us in this room has an idol. 
it's pretty safe to assume. Over the past couple of years, I went on this uh, journey. Uh, I, went, I had kind of this sabbatical. We spread it out over two years. And I went on this leadership training called Crest. And the purpose of Crest is to take Christian leaders at midlife and peel open the onion a little bit about our hearts and our lives and our gifts and our talents and who God made us to be and look at how God might be calling us to, to lead even better, to see more fruit, to see God do even more things in the second half of our lives than in the first half. Because most people, especially like male people, male pastor people, we tend to get stupid at midlife. And so I had three options, motorcycle, Porsche, or Crest leadership. Those were kind of the three options. Um, Danielle said no to the motorcycle because she's trying to keep me around a little bit longer. I can't afford the Porsche, so I settled for Crest leadership. Okay, so that's how that decision was made. And on the two-year journey, one of the things that we had to do is we had to learn some of our strengths. We had to learn about kind of what is one of your strengths as a leader. And what's fascinating is when you sit down and when you study one of your strengths, out of our strengths is also where we find most of our blind spots. And some of our biggest flaws actually come from our strengths. I'm just going to share an example, and this isn't to make me the hero of the story, just to be personal and to share the, share the example. I learned one of the strengths that I have is I'm not overly concerned what people think of me. Um, I want everyone to like me. I do. I do. I want everyone to like me, and it breaks my heart when people don't like me. But I'm not overly concerned with it. I know pastors who make themselves sick, ulcers, stress, and burnout from ministry with that intense desire to please everybody. And I, I'm not that guy. I'm not overly concerned about that. I'm not trying to do ministry in a way that pleases everybody. That's a strength in ministry. The flip side is, one of the big weaknesses is I may not be the type of leader that's trying to please everybody, but there's a select few that I am desperate to please. To the point if one of those leaders, one of those pastors, one of these people who I so admire, if they were ever to say something negative about me, my leadership, my marriage, my fathering, my preaching, it would devastate me. Is that admiration? Or is that idolatry? It's a little blurry <laughs> sometimes. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with commandment number one, commandment number two, and unpack this idea of what is God truly doing when it comes to the topic of the Ten Commandments. So again, if you have a Bible with you, Exodus chapter 20 is what I'm going to start reading from. I'm going to start right here in verse one. It says, and God spoke all these words. Let's stop there. <laughs> and God spoke. And God spoke. See, we believe that the spoken word of God is incredibly powerful. That at the spoken word of God, all of creation came into existence. Where there was nothing, there became everything. Where there was darkness, there became light. Where there was land, there became water. Where there was death, there became life. The spoken word of God is the power of God. And God spoke these words. God is bringing into existence something incredibly powerful when God speaks. So what did God speak? <laughs> Commandment number one in verse three, uh, sorry, in verse two. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord, your God, I am a jealous God. Punishing the children for the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. 
That's just commandment number one and number two. Uh, very, very familiar commands. Again, doesn't talk about anything about morality here yet. Doesn't talk anything about here's a law for all people in all countries, in all contexts, in all situation. The first two. <laughs> and kind of the way Old Testament kind of biblical writing works is priority, priority, priority. You start with the most important. You start with the big, oh my goodness, wow moments, right? The two first commandments, you shall have no other God before me. You shall not make an idol. Now again, to fully comprehend where we are in history when God spoke these words, I want to give you a very quick 15-minute history lesson. Okay? Especially if you're new to the Bible, and even if you're not new to the Bible, this is so important for us to get our brains around the context of where we are in history here. Right? The first book in your Bible is a book called Genesis. It starts with the words, in the beginning. This is God's story of God working in human history. In the beginning, God. God is outside of time. God is, is bigger more holy, more righteous, more than, more than anything that we can fully comprehend. And God spoke into existence everything. He created mankind in his image. Adam and Eve, he created them in his image. He created them to walk intimately with him. He created them to know no shame. And he created them to oversee the world and oversee the creation that he had put into place. And into that picture of paradise, we're introduced to evil. And the evil comes in the form of a tempter who says these simple words, you can be like God. You see, that's the human problem. We can be made in image and likeness of God. We can be close and intimate with God, but in our human flesh, that's not enough to be close to God. We want to be God. So this tempter comes and brings sin and death into the world. And God, right in that moment when he has to cast Adam and Eve out of paradise, when God curses the land, when sin is now become a main part of humanity, God in that moment makes a promise that I'm going to deal with sin, <laughs> that I'm going to restore you to myself, and I'm going to bring one who will eventually crush the head of this deceiver and this evil. <laughs> but then history starts to take its place, and we read throughout the book of Genesis this history of God working throughout human history. We read about a man named Abraham. Now, Abraham was just a man, he was a man, and the Bible says that he was righteous not because he kept the laws. He doesn't have it yet. Not because he kept all the religious traditions. He doesn't have them yet. Abraham is declared righteous because of his faith in the one true God. And God makes a covenant with Abraham that you are going to have more descendants than you can count. And from your descendants, from your family line, this is where the Messiah will come from. The one who will deal with the tempter. The one who will deal with evil. So Abraham submits to God. He has a son named Isaac. Isaac has a son named Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. That's psychotic. Like, I mean, I, I, my parenting thing, it was kind of our thing when Danielle and I were young parents. We just came with the decision... We're never going to let ourselves be outnumbered. It was just kind of like, we can play man on man. Like you get one, I get one. But this whole, like those of you who have more than two, I pray for you a lot. <laughs> this whole having to work zones and all that, that's crazy. And I'm using a lot of sports analogies today. I feel like I'm growing as a preacher. And um, <laughs> instead of it always being Star Wars stuff. Um, but 12 boys, <sighs> you moms of boys, you know how two or three or four are, 12 of them. That must have been crazy. They must have wanted to kill each other. Guess what? They did. <laughs> That's their story. These 12 boys, the second youngest one was a boy named Joseph. And jo God gives him a dream of the future where one day his brothers will bow down before him. 
Now, in that culture, just probably like in today's culture, we don't like the idea of having to bow down to a younger brother. And so they came with the plan, we're going to kill this dreamer. Now, thankfully, the brothers had a moment of compassion. And instead of killing him, they sold him into slavery. (laughs) Great, compassionate older brothers. So he goes off to the land of Egypt as a slave. He starts off as a slave of Pontifer, and that goes really bad. He gets arrested. But everywhere that Joseph goes, God is with him, and God blesses all the work that he does. There's a couple of people in prison. They have these dreams. Joseph interprets them. Pharaoh, the ruler of the most powerful nation in the world. They have the largest army. They have the most resources. They are the superpower of the world. The king there has a dream. None of his wizards and witches and warlocks can answer and interpret the dream. But they hear, hey, there's a Jewish slave in prison who can interpret dreams. So he shows up before the king of the world and says, God's got a warning for you that you're going to experience seven years of incredible wealth. The fields are going to like have a crop like you've never seen before. But then after those seven years, seven years of extreme famine are going to hit the land. It's going to get so bad you will forget how good it was. There won't be any, oh, you remember the good old days? You're going to be so miserable and so hungry, you won't even remember the good old days. So Pharaoh, king of the world, takes a Jewish slave and makes him the second most powerful person in the realm. Gives him all authority to handle and manage the food and the resources so that they could be blessed during those seven years. Now, Joseph gets a wife. The Pharaoh, the king, gives him a wife. She is the daughter of an Egyptian priest. Hold on to that for a moment. This Jewish slave fully integrates into the life of Egypt. So much so that when the famine finally came, when his brothers showed up looking for food, his brothers did not even recognize him. He knew the language, he knew the culture, he knew the religion. He knew the economics. He was fully integrated into the life of Egypt. 430 years go by. Okay, like I said, quick history lesson. 430 years go by, and the Jewish people multiply greatly. So much so that the new Pharaoh sees these people and how numerous they are, and he makes the decision to kill all the baby boys. Why the baby boys? Why not just all the babies? Here's why. Because men can get a lot of people pregnant at the same time. (laughs) That's how it works, right? One guy can have 20 wives, have 20 pregnant people. There's 20 babies coming. Also, the boys represented the army. So if you can destroy the population to come, get rid of more kids and destroy the future army, this was a strategic move on the part of Pharaoh to ensure that the people would stay weak. Okay? Into that scenario, a baby named Moses is born. And if you've seen the movie with Charlton Heston, you know how that played out. So the the baby's born, the guards are coming in to kill the baby. They make a little basket uh, you know, out of like twigs and, the, and they put the baby in it. They send it down the river. And then Pharaoh's daughter finds the baby. She wants to raise the baby as her own. So now again, a Hebrew slave living in the house of Egypt, becoming a prince of Egypt. He lives there for 40 years. He sees a Jewish slave being mistreated by an Egyptian slave driver. And Moses kills the slave driver. Now there's no laws that prevent an Egyptian from killing a Hebrew. You can kill as many of them as you want, that's fine. But as soon as Moses killed the Egyptian, he now has a death sentence and he has to take off and run and go into hiding. So he goes into hiding for 40 years. He meets another priest, the priest of Midian. And he receives a wife from another religion again. Okay? And he spends 40 years until God shows up and says, you are going to set my people free. 
Now, it's fascinating when you study the text, when you get into this, a lot of the times, because we look at movies like the Ten Commandments and the Prince of Egypt and things like that, we make certain assumptions about the land of Egypt. And we make certain assumptions about the people of Israel in the land of Egypt. And the biggest assumption that we make is that the Israelites are still worshiping God. We make the assumption that the Israelites are still worshiping God while in Egypt. The text tells us something different. Even the Apostle Paul makes a reference to this in one of his letters, is that the people have turned completely from God. And they are worshiping the gods of Egypt. (laughs) You see, they don't know God. They, They haven't talked to God. They haven't heard from God. They haven't worshiped God in 400 years. Right from Joseph. Joseph was fully integrated into Egyptian life with a daughter from the priest of the town of Un. (laughs) Fully integrated into this lifestyle of worshiping other gods, not knowing who God is. Not knowing what God has done. So when Moses is coming to set the people free, he is not only coming to free them from slavery, He is coming to save them from religious bondage. He's bringing God's people back to God. Let that sit for a moment. That is a much bigger thing that Moses is doing. This isn't simply we don't like being slaves. We want to go to the promised land. We want all the blessings. Moses is doing something very different. Yes, he's freeing them. Yes, he's fulfilling the covenant that God made with Abraham to bring them to the promised land. But the goal of God is ultimately about bringing people back to him. God is creating a new community. God is creating a new nation that will look radically different, will behave radically different than every other culture that exists at that time. See, if God was simply giving a good moral code to humanity to live by, why not give the Ten Commandments to Pharaoh? Like, think about it. Who has more influence to implement the Ten Commandments as the moral code for everybody to live by? Moses or Pharaoh? If I was God and I was giving humanity a list of rules to live by, I'd pick Pharaoh. He can implement it. He can send his armies. He can enforce it. He can make laws. He can change the government. Because he is the government. But God wasn't doing that. God was not giving a list of rules for everybody. He was giving a list of rules for his people. See, and then, I mean, just look at how the book of Exodus continues. Because it's not just about 10 commandments. Moses spends the next 11 chapters going over hundreds of commandments. Look at this. I'm just going to summarize some of these. Chapter 21 talks about servants, how you treat your servants. Talks about what you do about personal injury. If someone hurts you, what do you do about that? Talking about protecting your property. Talks about social responsibilities. He talks about the law of justice and mercy. He talks about keeping the Sabbath. We're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. He talks about all these annual festivals. He's going to party. God likes a party. We need to celebrate and party more often as the church. It's in here. He talks about the covenant that's being confirmed. And then he gets into the whole sacrificial system. He talks about the tabernacle and bringing the offerings before God, the animals that had to be sacrificed in order to please God, to pay for sin. Talks about the Ark of the Covenant, how to build that. Talks about the table, talks about the lampstands, talks about the fire and the flames that are supposed to be a part of worship services. Why don't we have fire? (laughs) It's biblical, right? It's biblical that we should have flames of fire shooting up on Sunday morning. I would love to go to this worship service. This, when people say, oh, worship is supposed to be quiet and somber. I'm like, really, have you read your Bible? It's a gong show. It's insane. 
It's trumpets, it's chanting, it's fire. There's animals being cut in half and the blood being splattered on the back wall. Woo! Okay, and we're just in chapter 26. Then he goes into the, the burnt offerings, the courtyard. He talks about how the priests are supposed to dress. There's like two chapters on that. I'm wearing a Star Wars t-shirt. You know, it's like, man, like there's two chapters of how I'm supposed to dress. The incense that we're supposed to use, the anointing oil, the way we're supposed to wash our hands. It goes on and on and on. Twelve chapters. And then you get to chapter 32. And do you know what? After receiving 12 chapters of law and commandments that start with commandment one, you shall have no other God. And, and commandment two that says, you will not make an idol. You know what the first thing the people of Israel do after receiving all of this? They worship another God and they make an idol. It's the first thing they do. Why? Because it is in our hearts as human beings to drift away from God. All of us. All of us. It is not an outside the church problem. It is an inside the church problem. It's not a new Christian problem. It's someone who's been walking with Jesus for 80 years problem. There is something in us that we can drift away from God. And third, uh, sorry, 12 chapters of laws and commandments can't fix that heart. <laughs> The whole Bible is all about rule, 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 rule. And we get to the day and age of Jesus where the same temptation that was that Adam and Eve faced, that you can be like God, is the same temptation that Jesus faces when he begins his public ministry. When Jesus spends 40 days out in the wilderness, he fasts, he doesn't have anything to eat, he's praying, he's meeting with God, and then that same tempter comes. And we read about this in Matthew's gospel in chapter four. It says in verse eight, talk, it says, again, the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And the devil said, all of this I will give you if you would bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. You see, you may not have an idol that we bow down to at home, but you and I have temptations. <laughs> you and I have struggle. You and I have just have life <laughs> to deal with. And sometimes life has a way to cause even followers of God to drift away from God. So when we study the Ten Commandments, I don't study the Ten Commandments to enforce the Ten Commandments to live that, that my non-Christian friends or my atheist family members must live by the Ten Commandments. I look at them so I can check my own heart and go, how am I doing? As being a distinct, set-apart person that God has called into his family you will have no other God before me. You will not allow anything to show up in your life that is more important to you than me. Not your spouse, not your kids, not your career, not your education, not your bank account, not your ministry. How big is my church? Is the attendance on going up and to the right? Because that's what we like. We like graphs that go up and to the right. <laughs> or does ministry look like this? <laughs> Feels that way. <laughs> what do you and I put in our lives without even realizing it takes us away from putting God first? It's an easy thing to say. God is first in my life. But when we open up our hearts, we open up our lives, when we're real before God, real before one another, all of us do things 
all of us do things where we don't put God first. I did it on Friday where I had one of my pity parties and I'm like, I'm tired. I've been working hard. I've been working late. I'm not looking at my email. It's all about me, me, me. I'm the priority. I deserve. And I'm going, what am I preaching on again on Sunday? Oh yeah, put God first. It's not about me. So how do we do this? What does it mean to be Christians in the world today? Not kind of living under this legalism of the law, but the heart of the law of being people that are set apart, being people that are different, people who have been set free from slavery, set free from sin. A couple of ways that we do this. How do we put God first? Well, I think it's actually the answer for it is right here in the Ten Commandments, in these first two commandments. If you want to put God first in your life, try these. The first is this. Remember who God is. Remember who God is. Exodus 20 verse 1 starts with, I am the Lord, your God. See, a lot of the times in the Old Testament, when God introduces himself to someone, he'll say something like, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He uses a terminology going, I am the God of your ancestors. And now again, that's showing how God has worked all throughout human history. But there's something very different than when God shows up and says, and again, God spoke these words. I am the Lord, your God. And he's saying this to a group of people who have been far away from God for 430 years. <laughs> who've allowed the worship of Egyptian gods and the marrying of Egyptian priests and priestesses to get intermingled into the people of God. And God is reminding them of this incredibly important statement. I am the Lord, your God. We need to remember who God is. See, we live in a culture in a day and an age that I find fascinating. And sometimes I think, sometimes as Christian leaders, I think we get a little bit discouraged on kind of, oh, the church and the church isn't doing good. Oh my goodness, these days are amazing. There's huge opportunities to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world today. There's amazing opportunities to share our faith today. We have nothing to worry about. It's the same God is working in the church today like he was in the 50s. So it's just as good, right? But there is a shift culturally. And one of the big shifts is, I don't need someone to explain faith to me. You see, I have the almighty Google and the almighty YouTube. I can watch all these videos. I can read all these books. People tend to want to come up with their own spirituality on their own. And that's the culture we live in today. It's, I don't need a pastor to tell me what the Bible says. I can figure that out for myself. I don't need a community of people to study this thing together. I can pick and choose the spirituality I want. It's real easy to do. And again, not an outside the church thing. It's an inside the church thing, right? We can pick and choose the spirituality we want. Let's talk hell. Let's pick the easy one. I don't want to believe that a loving God would ever send anyone to hell. Therefore, God won't. I pick the God I want the doctrine that I want to believe. Let's pick another easy one, sexual ethics. Just this week, did you see this get released on social media? The Church of England released an official position that the Church of England believes that human sexuality is meant for the context of covenant lifelong marriage between one man, biological, and one female, biological. You got to specify that nowadays because it's confusing, and that is what human sexuality is for. And they released that on social media. They're getting crucified for it. Literally. People are freaking out that the church holds a position that human sexuality is between one man, one mo woman in a covenant marriage for life. And people are surprised. What? <laughs> Am I the only one who sees the humor in that? We're surprised that that's the position of the church. It's the teaching of the Bible. But I don't like it. 
So I'm going to pick this instead. Doesn't matter who I sleep with, doesn't matter how I identify, none of that matters. We create the God we want. Commandment number two is you won't do that. See, in a day and an age where we want to make spirituality whatever we want it to be, the danger is we forget the God who is and create the God we want. We need to remember who God is. How do you do that? You read your Bible. You read your Bible. And here's the thing. When you get to a part of the Bible that you don't like, God is okay with that. He's not offended by it. He's not doesn't hurt his feelings. He doesn't need to find a safe space and have a quiet time and get himself together because he's been triggered by the fact that you're unhappy with him. Okay, God doesn't work that way. God is okay with you not liking something in the Bible. When you find that thing, don't just rip that page out of your Bible. Work through it. Talk to your life group leader. Get a book. Read on it. God is okay with us wrestling through this stuff together. Don't do it alone in isolation. Do it in the context of community. Right? The Christian faith, the Hebrew faith, scripture was always given to community. So we need, the temptation is to create the God we want. But I am the Lord, your God. You want to put God first? Spend time remembering who God is. The second thing that you can do if you want to remember who God is, sorry, if you want to put God first in your life, remember what God has done. Remember what God has done. Again, right here in the very first verse, it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. God spoke. He's reminding his people what God has done. See, again, in our humanness, we can forget what God has done. One of the things that I do almost daily is I remember that God died for me. See, because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a workaholic. I love my job. And if I was a single man, if I didn't have a wife and kids at home, I would work 24-7. 24, I'd never leave the office. I would work, 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 just work. And I'd strive and I'd build and I'd grow this thing. And then I take a moment and I remember, <laughs> oh, Jesus builds his church. Not Kevin. Kevin needed to be saved from his sin. (laughs) Kevin's not perfect. Kevin's got stuff. Kevin needs the blood of Jesus and the Holy Spirit in him to work on that. (laughs) I remind myself almost daily that God loves me so much, he'd die for me. I think, you know, when we say we need to preach the gospel because the world needs the gospel, the church, Christians need the gospel. We need to be reminded what God has done daily. And then we need to remember the other ways that God has shown up in our lives. I remember a number of years ago, I've shared this before, Danielle was really sick. And God healed her. And it messed up my Baptist theology. And that's a good thing when our theology gets a little messed up sometimes. We get so used to our boxes. And I remember that. So when another family is sick, when someone in the church is sick, I remember what God has done before. One of the ways, if you want to remember what God has done, I encourage people to journal. It doesn't have to be every day. Don't be legalistic about it, but it might be just get a little notebook from the dollar store and just start journaling. Start keeping track of the prayers that God answers. If you come into my office, I can show it to you. I've got a shelf in my, one of my bookshelves, there's about a row of journals about that long. And over 20 years, not every day, and there's gaps. There's like a year and a half gap in, in there all over the place. But I kind of just, when God moves, when God's working, when God's stirring in my heart, I just have, I just journal this stuff so I can actually go back. And I can look at that again going, oh yeah, remember what God did? I do have one journal. If you ever see my list of journals there, I've got one. Uh, that one needs to be set on fire um, after I die. Uh, no one's allowed to read that one uh, because that's my angry journal. 
if anyone ever read that, you'd think I was psychotic. It's like, oh my goodness, like bring in the, the doctors, get the straight jacket, drag him out of the building. There was something seriously wrong with Pastor Kevin. So that one, no one gets to read that one, please. And so if I die suddenly, you guys are my witnesses. Someone needs to go in my office and burn that so no one's allowed to read it. Okay, can you just do that favor for me, please? Like, please? Anyways, okay, cool. I just need that one burnt. Okay, but anyways, I journal. I actually have a binder with all the notes from the very first Bible study I ever attended 20 years ago. And I have the prayer requests of people that I haven't spoken to in 20 years. And I glance at that from time to time. And I look at it, like, wow, God healed that marriage. God got that guy off of pornography. God did this. God did that. We need to remember what God has done. If you want to put God first, remember who he, who he is. Don't give in to the temptation to make the God you want. You need to remember what God has done in the past to be mindful of what he will do in the future. And then finally, just very quickly, we need to be lovingly transformed by the commands of God. Again, there's this notion that in our culture today, we don't want anyone to command me. Who are you to tell me? Well, I'm not telling you nothing. God is. If you have put your faith in Jesus, if you have turned from your sin and turned to God to deal with your sin, God comes into your life. The Holy Spirit comes into you. The Bible says you are the temple of God. As the Spirit of God lives in you, you are now different. You are are set apart. And we don't keep these commandments in order to make God like us. We don't keep the commandments in order to please God and make God happy with us. God loves you. God loves you. You need to remember, do you, do you believe that? God loves you. And he loves you so much. He died for you. He paid for something that you could not, I could not pay. He loves you. And just like all of you who are parents, you have given commands and rules to your children not because you hate them. Not because you want to mess them up. There's no parent that I have met that's going, man, I can't wait till my kid grows up and they're so screwed in the head that they're going to spend millions of dollars on therapy to get through all the damage I've done to them. Sometimes parent, kids, we think that's what our parents are doing. They're trying to mess us up and ruin our lives. They love you. They do. Just like our heavenly father loves us, the commands of God are not things that we do to please God, to earn his salvation. But as God has given us a new heart, we live out of those loving commands of God. And it has to start with putting God first. That we will not allow anything to get in the way of our, our worship that we're not going to create a God that isn't the true God, that we're not going to follow these false things, that we will learn who God is. We will know who God is. We will trust that God will continue to work in our lives, in our church, in our city, in our nation. So when we put God first, like we're trusting that God is dealing with this human problem that we have. The human problem that we have is we want to drift away from God. But praise be to God that Jesus dealt with it. That Jesus came to give us life and life to the full. That Jesus would be born of a virgin. That he would live a sinless life. That he would go to the cross. And that even people who didn't follow God would see the way that Jesus died. And centurions would look at Jesus dying on the cross and say, Truly, this is the Son of God. Because as he bled there and died, he looked at his enemies and said, God, forgive them. They have no clue what they're doing. And he died 
a sinner's death. He became sin. He was cursed on that tree. He's put in another man's tomb to show his extreme poverty in the world and he has no social standing whatsoever. And then three days later, God raised him from the dead to show the world. Hundreds of people saw this and they became his witnesses to the known world that God has come in the flesh, that humanity can be made right again. God was in the business in Moses' day of freeing people and bringing people back into his family. And God is still in that business today of freeing people and bringing people into the family. So when you and I leave here today, wherever God sends you tomorrow, school, you're different. You're different than everybody else. Work, you're you're different than everybody else. Your hobby groups, your social clubs, your sports teams, wherever God sends you, you're different because you are set apart. (laughs) And we can spend the next four weeks looking at this and look at these laws and say, here's how everyone else should live. (laughs) My challenge for myself as we kick this series off, my challenge for you is, no, how am I living? (laughs) As someone who is a part of the family of God, am I truly putting God First, I shall have no other gods before him. I shall not make for myself an image in the form of anything. I will not put anything before God because God is a jealous God and he'll fight for you. Sometimes God will give you so much of the stuff that you want that you'll choke on it. And some guy, sometimes God will take it all away from you till it just drives you insane. But he'll fight for you because he loves you that much. And we see the blessing of that on how this commandment finishes. When it talks about, you know, that God punishes the children of the sin of the parents. That makes it sound, my parents are bad, so I'm suffering. So I'm going to go on the Oprah show and I'm going to talk about that. Or I'm going to talk about it to Dr. Phil. My mother was so terrible. It's not what it is. This is just kind of a reminder that this is how sin works. Sin just has a way of continuing. The alcoholic raises an alcoholic who raises an alcoholic who raises an alcoholic. The abuse, the abuse, the abuse, the abuse, the neglect. It just, that's how your sin works until there's a miracle of God to break that. And when God shows up in a miracle and draws people back to himself, but shows love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep them. So as we kick this series off, my challenge for all of us is, how are we putting God first? Let's pray. Well, Father God, I praise you and thank you um, for a very, very familiar text. But one, when we unpack it, there is so much truth, so much stuff in here And so, Father, I pray as we uh, begin this journey together on looking at how you have called people to live as a set-apart community, that you have called the people of Israel back to you. You set them free from slavery. You set them free from false religion. And God, you are still in that business today, that you are setting people free from the sin in their lives You're setting me free from sin. You're setting us as a church free from sin. But you're also drawing more people into this family as a community of people set apart for your glory. So Father, I pray for all of us today that we would put you first. That we would remember who you are. That we wouldn't be afraid to wrestle with the stuff about you that we're not comfortable with or the stuff that we don't like but that we would come and we would learn and we would grow and we would figure this out. God, we're grateful that you have created the church where we could do this together. We don't have to do it alone. Father, I pray that you would bring to mind for all of us um, reminders of what you have done in the past. For those times when you feel far away, remind us that you're close. For those times when we feel like you're not answering our prayers, remind us of the times that you did. Help us to remember 
And Father, as we lovingly submit to your will in our lives, we pray and we praise you that you are a loving Father who's guiding his children in how you would have us live in this world today. We're going to collect our offering now. It's just part of our worship. If you're a guest, uh, please don't feel obligated to give unless God puts it on your heart to do so. And as we sing this last song together, I just encourage you, just take a moment while we're singing these lyrics to reflect, remember who God is. Remember what God has done. And remember how much God loves you. And that's what we sing out of that love for what, that we have for God because of this love that he has for us. Because he is our God. He is your God. And he's close and he's here. Let's worship. Twelve chapters of commands and rules and regulations can't stop our heart from drifting away from God. Only the powerful name of Jesus can do that. So we remember the God who is. We remember what God has done and we lovingly submit to his loving commands for our lives. You are different. This is not a command for them. It is for us. Put God first in our lives and watch God move. If you're here today and you would like someone to pray for you, prayer room on the left side of the room there, joining us online, send a direct message. We'll be praying for you. But I pray that you would go in the mighty, powerful name of Jesus today, living the life that God has called you to live wherever he sends you this week and look forward to worshiping with you again next week. God bless you.